Welcome back to Berean's Bible Institute. This is Module 2B. We are talking about uh, wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 and how the New Testament apostles interpreted that and applied that to Jesus Christ. Um, in Proverbs 8, we have uh, you have on your screen there, Proverbs 8, 22 through 30. And also Colossians 1 14 through 20 I want to draw some comparisons as I do commonly I have color-coded the common themes between the two passages if there is a passage in the New Testament that is clearly referring to Proverbs chapter 8 and this wisdom um, that's referred to there it is clearly Colossians chapter 1 14 through 20 I don't think anyone really disputes that so let's look at the let's look at the uh, the two passages. I want to read Proverbs eight first, then we'll look at Colossians one. Um, and as we go through it, please pay close attention to the color coding of the common language between the two passages. All right. So in Proverbs eight, this is from uh, the um, Septuagint. It says, "The Lord created me." as the beginning of his ways now you may notice that i have as crossed out here that's because that was added by the translator it's not actually in the original text it's not in either the hebrew or the septuagint it's added in both in many translations but if you leave it out you get the correct sense i think all right so it's not that the lord created me as the beginning it's the lord created me the beginning that is, the Lord made me the beginning of his ways. And we're going to talk more about that, the beginning, um, in the next slide. So, the Lord created or made me the beginning of his ways for the sake of his works. Before the present age, he founded me. In the beginning, before he made the earth and before he made the depths, before he brought forth the springs of water, before the mountains were established and before all the hills, he begets me. The Lord made countries and uninhabited spaces and the habitable heights of, of that beneath the sky. When he prepared the sky, I was present with him. When he marked out his own throne on the winds, when he made strong the clouds above and when he made secure the springs beneath the sky, when he made strong the foundations of the earth I was beside him fitting together the Hebrew I believe says uh, as a master craftsman it is I who was the one in whom he took delight now let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verses 14 through 20 this is from the LGV uh, in whom we have release through his blood now I have the I have all of the pronouns or identifiers that refer to this person specifically in highlighted in red, okay, in both of these passages. So in whom here obviously is Christ because it talks about his blood here, right? The pardon of sins. Now, this pronoun is very important. This is a masculine pronoun. Who is the image of the God who is unseen? first produced of all creation now let's look at the let's look at the identifying uh, uh, terms pronouns and this term the beginning in Proverbs 8 all right this is a person in whom these are presented as a person we have a person speaking who's called who refers to himself as me and refers to himself as the beginning and here he is begotten, right? And I, 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 present with God. All right, all these are personal terms that refer to the person who is speaking here. Paul uses the same language here, right? In whom he is, who is the image of the God who is unseen. Now we have here, first produced of all creation. Well, that certainly is coming from this passage right here, right? The Lord made me, 
or created me the beginning. He founded me. He begets me. So this begotten language is being drawn directly out of Proverbs chapter 8. It's applied to Christ as being the first produced of all creation. What's important about this is this statement right here, who is, which must refer to Christ as a person. So Christ himself is first produced of all creation. No, no question it's referring to this passage. But what this does is it requires then that this person who is begotten here is an actual person. It is Christ. In order for Christ here to be the first produced of all creation, then, and clearly it's a reference to Proverbs 8, then this must be a real person in Proverbs 8. Not only a literary device, a personification, as biblical Unitarians will tell you. All right, now it says, um, and note all creation here, which is here he's talking about all creation as well, that you see in blue letters here, right? So then it goes on to say in verse 16, because in him everything was created. Now, in him is kind of an ambiguous term. The preposition in here is an in Greek, um, and it has a very broad um, scope of meaning, how it's used throughout the Bible. But as we'll see here, it gets much more specific in a moment. In him, everything was created. Notice was created. We're talking about past tense. He uses the um, aorist tense here in the Greek, which means everything has already been created. It's not everything is being created. It's not, you know, biblical Unitarians are going to tell you, well, this is talking about the new creation. No, because it's all in the past tense, right? The new creation isn't finished yet. The new creation is barely even started yet, right? We have, you know, in Revelation, God saying, behold, I make all things new. He's renewing everything, the land and the sky, everything in the land, everything on the sky and so forth um, in the book of Revelation. But this is something that is past, and that's the critical point. So Christ is the first produced of all creation, in him, everything was created. That's past tense. What is in the skies and what is on the land. Now, that doesn't leave anything out, right? The seen and the unseen, or some translations say the visible and the invisible. Well, what is it that is left out of this? Everything you see around you, everything in the creation, everything that you see on the land, everything you see on the sky that was created, past tense, was created, here it says, in him, the seen and the unseen, including thrones, dominions, principalities, and authorities. Now, thrones, dominions, principalities, and authorities can refer either to the angelic realm, or it can also refer to human government, um, because all of that is a part of this creation as well. That is the, the whole order that God has ordained for mankind is included in all of this. Well, what is the what are the thrones, dominions, principalities, and authorities now? And are these only thrones, dominions, principalities, and authorities of the new creation? No, because those things haven't been created yet, right? If you look in uh, Revelation chapter 20, when it says, you know, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. Uh, and so forth. And he's talking about the saints reigning with Christ a thousand years uh, there in the kingdom, right? So none of that has been created yet, but everything that is being spoken of in this passage has already been created. That is everything in the sky, everything on the land, everything you can see, and everything that is unseen has already was created in him. Now notice this statement here, everything has been created through him and for him. Now through him here, the, the preposition um, through is dia, followed by the genitive case uh, pronoun him, 
Whenever that occurs, it refers to agency. That is, it refers to God using someone or something in order to accomplish something. But that thing has to be real and has to be present in order for God to use it to accomplish something. So this, what this statement is essentially saying is that the entire creation that we see around us has been created through the agency of the Son. So it, is, it has been created through him and for him. Well, why does he say it's created for him? Because he's going to inherit all things, according to Psalm chapter 2. And he is, that is Christ, is before everyone. Now, this, this word can be translated everyone or everything. Um, it, it can be translated either way, but I believe everyone is the, is the better translation. And everything has been established together through him. Now, a lot of translations here will say uh, everything um, stands together or something like that using a present tense verb, but that's not correct. It's a perfect tense verb, which means it's something that has happened in the past, but the result continues to the present. So again, it's still talking about the original creation that was established through Christ and has continued to stand because of its original establishment through him. All right, so again, through him, dia, that preposition. He is the agent through which everything was established and now continues to stand. He is also the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning. Now, this is a critical statement here because if you look back up here in Proverbs 8, this person who is speaking is, says that the Lord made this person the beginning of his ways. Paul uses the beginning here as a title, and that's what it means here, right? Who is, that is Christ is, the beginning as a title that can only come directly out of Proverbs 8, 22. First produced out from among the dead. Now, this is a really interesting statement. I want you to notice where it says first produced here and first produced here. The word, the Greek word is prototakos, which is proto meaning first, takos meaning something that is produced. It can be produced. Uh, the word takos can refer to plants producing. It can refer to humans. Um, anything that is produced. Now, it's usually translated firstborn, but being birthed is not really part of the meaning of it. It literally means uh, first produced and often, in fact, usually refers to being first produced from a father as opposed to a mother. All right. But here, first produced of all creation. Now, what you're going to find is that uh, biblical Unitarians are going to try to make this word here first produced uh, not referring to first in sequence but first in priority so instead of it meaning first act first produced first before anything else of the creation they're going to say it means superior to or having authority over all creation in fact the new king james version translates this as firstborn over all creation, but they're adding the word over. It's not in the text. They're changing the text in order to make it uh, appear that it's talking about rank as opposed to sequence. But the thing you need to notice is that the same word here, first produced of all creation, is the same word found here, first produced out from among the dead. And here it's clearly talking about sequence. Christ is the first one to be raised from the dead. Peter says that, I believe, in Acts, that he's the first to be raised to immortality from the dead. And that's clearly what this is referring to here. Christ is the first produced out from among the dead, first produced to immortality, right? So if first produced here, prototakos means first in sequence, which it clearly does, 
then it also means first in sequence here and not only first in priority. And another point um, that's worth mentioning is that in Jewish thought, first in priority comes from being first in sequence. That is, this is why a firstborn child usually outranks his brothers is because he is born first, right? So sequence implies, first in sequence implies first in pr priority, but first in priority without first in sequence is not something that's, that is common here. All right? There are some rare occasions where it's true, but that's not the norm. All right. So first produced of all creation literally means that the son of God, Christ, who is clearly the one referenced in all these uh, pronouns here, was produced first before anything was produced within the creation itself. All right, so first produced. Now, this doesn't mean that he is a created being because first produced can refer to, or the word produced can refer to something created or it can be referred to something procreated, right? Begotten, and that's clearly the case here because God begets wisdom, all right? All right, so anyway... Um, Everything has been created through him and for him. He is before everyone. That is, he precedes everyone. So he's preceding everyone in his being produced first. He's preceding everyone here. Notice all of these before statements in Proverbs chapter 8. How many times are they stressing before? Look, look at this again. The Lord created or made me the beginning of his ways for the sake of his works. And he did this before the present age. He founded me. In the beginning, before he made the earth, before he made the depths, before he brought forth the springs of waters, before the mountains were established, before all the hills, he begets me. So all of these statements in verses 22 through 25 are there to tell us that God produced this person who's speaking before he did anything else and made this person the beginning of his ways for his works. That is, the intention was to use this person called the beginning as his agent to create all things. That is, for his works. All right? So, here... First produced of all creation means Christ was sequentially produced before anything else in the creation here. Um, and he is before everyone or all things. That is, he existed before everything else named in the creation, before everything in the skies or in the land as we see up here. All right, now he is also the head of the body, the assembly, that is the church, who is the beginning, first produced out from among the dead, so that in all things he should become the prototype. Now this is an important statement because what Paul is doing here when he says in everything, he is to be the prototype, that is the one who is first in everything, first in sequence, which makes him first in priority in all of these things, first in the creation, um, first in um, being raised from the dead, and now he is the, uh, the one who is the head of the body. So it is because of all of these things of him being first that gives him the right to be the head or the one who is first in rank in the assembly. And that's the point that Paul's making here. Um, because it pleased God for all the fullness to reside in him. Now, I want you to notice something here. What, what you're going to find if you, if you listen to biblical Unitarians is the way they try to get around what this passage is saying is that they claim that, well, it's talking about, as I said, it's talking about the new creation here. All right, not the original creation, but the new creation. In other words, all things um, here, everything 
everything, most translations say all things, everything, talking about being created and being established together. But look what we have down here. It says, for um, because it pleased God for all the fullness to reside in him and through him, that is through Christ. Again, we have through him, through him here regarding everything being created through him. Now he's saying, and through him to reconcile everything to himself. Well, what does everything or all things refer to here? It's the same everything that has been created. So the problem that biblical Unitarians are going to run into with their interpretation of everything, you know, created referring to the new creation, not only do they have a problem with the fact that it's all past tense here and the new creation isn't here yet, but they also have a problem with the fact that everything that was, was created through the Son must be reconciled to God also through the Son. Well, this cannot be the original creation because the original creation, if it was, if it's created, if it's already created through the Son, why does the new creation need to be reconciled to God through the Son? It doesn't. It's already reconciled to God, right? There's, if it's already, if the new creation is created through Christ here, then why does the new creation have to be reconciled to God? through him using the very same language here right it's dia altu through him through the same person whom everything was created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible through that same person everything is reconciled to god having made peace through the blood of his cross through him now if and if anybody is questioning whether the everything here is the, is the same as everything that was created. Look at this statement. What is on the land or in the sky is the same thing he set up here, right? What is in the skies and what is on the land? So everything that's part of the creation that was made through the sun is to be reconciled to God through the sun both what is on the land and what is in the skies. All right. There is no way that this passage can refer to here, the new creation. This is the original creation. There's no question about it. All right. And there's no question that the apostle Paul in making all of these connections here to wisdom in Proverbs eight, there's no question that what he's doing is he is doing exactly what he said in first Corinthians chapter one. And two, when he talked about the hidden wisdom, which had been kept secret since the foundation of the world, he's revealing this hidden wisdom here. This was the wisdom that was hidden in what appears at first glance to be just a literary device, a personification. Paul is revealing it because, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, God has revealed this hidden wisdom by his spirit through his apostles and it was not understood previously. So when biblical Unitarians, what, the, what they do essentially is they turn all this wisdom stuff completely backwards and upside down. They say, well, look, look how the Jews understood this wisdom in Proverbs. Look how they understood it as just a personification. It's not a real person. So therefore, they come to the New Testament and they try to make all of this language fit that idea that wisdom is just a personification. But if you take what Paul says literally, first of all, that all this was hidden and concealed in the Old Testament from Israel, therefore they didn't understand it. So it cannot be the basis, their understanding cannot be the basis for how we are to understand what the apostles taught. What the apostles taught is something new, something that was revealed that is concealed here and revealed here. What is revealed must be in plain literal language. You can't use obscure metaphors and enigmas 
<clears throat> to explain another metaphor and enigma. So what essentially what what biblical Unitarians are doing is they're taking the way they claim that the Jews understood this and saying now that Paul, when writing this, yeah, he's making these connections, but he's imposing their filter on his language. And so you have to have the Jewish way of thinking in order to even understand Paul. That's nonsense. And the reason it's nonsense is because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and the, and the Gentiles, they were not really all that familiar with this kind of language. Yeah, it's in the Septuagint. Yeah, it's in the Old Testament. But this is this is not something that um, the Apostle Paul would um, portray in the manner that uh, biblical Unitarians do. They have these complex filters that you have to view all this stuff through. And again, as I showed, their explanation just doesn't work here. It just will not work all right okay um, I want to move on to uh, a couple of statements that Jesus made now one of these statements um, we've already looked at briefly in the previous section in uh, module 2 section a um, we looked at it only briefly I want to compare it here because it deals with wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 so again let's look at Proverbs 8, 22, the Lord made me the beginning of his ways for his works. Now, the point I want to make here is that in the Septuagint, the word me here, me, and beginning in Greek is me archon. Me archon. Both of these words me and beginning are in the accusative case. The accusative case is the case of the direct object of the verb. All right. Now, the fact that both me and beginning here are in the accusative case means that the both terms are terms of identifying who is receiving the action of the word made. All right. Who is receiving it? The Lord made me, comma, the beginning. All right, so he's being called, calling himself both me, and he's calling himself the beginning. All right, that's the point I want you to see. Now, in John chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, um, Jesus is being uh, challenged by these, the uh, leaders, the religious leaders of the day. And he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. This is another one of those, uh, you know, I came down from heaven statements in the Gospel of John, which biblical Unitarians try so hard to avoid and explain away. He says, you are from below, I am from above. You are from this world, I am not from this world. Therefore, I said to you, that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am or I am this that is the, what he had just stated that is that he is from above that he is not from this world unless you believe that I am this you will die in your sins then they said to him who are you and Jesus said to them now this is critical the beginning and that which I am telling you. Now here, when Jesus answered their question, when they said, who are you? And he just said, the beginning, he says, archon. That is the Greek word for beginning in the accusative case, which is exactly what we find here. The beginning is archon in the accusative case in Proverbs 8.22. So what Jesus was essentially doing when they said, who are you? He simply repeated this title right here in order to answer their question. The beginning and that which I am telling you. Well, what is it that he was telling them? He was telling them that he is from above and that he is not from this world. So his answer to their question of who are you was twofold. He points them back to what he just said. 
I'm from above, I'm not from this world. And number two, he says he is the beginning, which is a clear and direct reference to Proverbs 8.22. Now, as I pointed out when we looked at this uh, in a previous video briefly, most translations add words to Jesus' statement in order to make it say something different. It will be something like, uh, Jesus said to them, that which I have told you from the beginning, and they'll add the word from. They completely rearrange the sentence, and then they add the word from so that it appears that he's just saying, you know, that which I not am telling you, but that which, and, and by the way, this is present tense, but they'll change it to a past tense, that which I have told you, something like that. From the beginning, I mean, in, in other words, the beginning of his ministry, which is completely wrong. If you want a tran an actual, tra another translation that translates this correctly, it is the Catholic Bible, the douay Rheims. Uh, version of the Bible actually translates it correctly that Jesus responds by saying when they say who are you he says the beginning and that which I'm telling you all right so that's another translation that has it exactly as it's written in the Greek text without altering it now just keep in mind that one of the reasons why you're gonna find this kind of language um, obscured in most Bible translations is because they have a Trinitarian bias and Trinitarians cannot accept the idea that Proverbs 8 is referring to Christ. They cannot accept it. They be, and that's because if Proverbs 8 is a reference to Christ, just as Paul clearly shows us in Colossians chapter 1, then Christ had a beginning because it's clear from Proverbs 8.22 that actually 22 23 and 24 right if the, if proverbs 8 22 is about christ then christ becomes or is the beginning christ is established christ is begotten all at the beginning of creation week prior to god's creating everything so trinitarians have a problem there they've got a dilemma because they will acknowledge that, well, the, in the beginning was the Word in John 1, 1, or that's referring to, that's referring to Christ there as the Word, which I agree it is, the Son is the Word. But here, the same language that we see in John 1, 3, that is through him all things were, were made, and without him not one thing originated, is what John 1, 3 says. We see the same language happening in Colossians 1 where it's clearly pointing us back to wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8 but you know Trinitarians that they have a problem with with that and so what you will see in these translations is where Christ is being clearly identified with wisdom in Proverbs 8 as you will see them add words or change things so that it doesn't actually make that connection all right so um, don't let them get away with it. And, and the problem here also is that uh, biblical Unitarians often will borrow bad translations from Trinitarian translations because it also serves their purposes in denying um, that, that uh, Christ was in the beginning with God and, and things of that nature. All right. So if Jesus says to them that he is the beginning, he's clearly identifying himself as the person in Proverbs chapter 8, just as Paul did in Colossians chapter 1. All right, now, finally, uh, as we close here, let's look at the Revelation 3.14. This is from the LGV. Uh, and to the messenger, this is Jesus speaking in, uh, to uh, one of the letters uh, to the churches. To the messenger for the assembly in Laodicea write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation says this. Now, there's absolutely no question that this statement, the beginning of God's creation here, is a reference to this. There's no question about it. Now, you'll find that uh, biblical Unitarians will um, change this passage for example um, anthony buzzard's translation he said he changes the beginning here of god's creation to the ruler 
of God's creation. But the problem there is a ruler is a concrete noun. And, but the problem here is that this, the beginning, is a feminine noun, which in Greek, typically feminine nouns um, are used for abstract things, not for concrete things. All right, so it's arche here, where it would be archon if it was referring to an actual ruler. And actually, Anthony Buzzard translates that correctly in another passage in chapter 1 of Revelation, where Jesus is called the ruler of the kings of the earth. And we have the masculine term there, archon. But here, the feminine term, arche, which is normally means the beginning, he translates it also as the ruler. So that's uh, that's an incorrect uh, translation. But again, that's he's doing what, what Trinitarians do here. Trinitarians, they, they change this so that it doesn't support the connection to Proverbs 8. And so uh, in Anthony's translation, he's changing this word so that this doesn't make the connection. Jesus isn't referring himself back you know, putting himself in the context of Proverbs 8 here as well. This is the kind of trickery that we see coming out of uh, both Trinitarian and Unitarian, Biblical Unitarian, um, dealing with some of these critical passages. All right? They're playing musical chairs with some of the terminology. Anyway, um, that's it for today, and hope you got something out of that, and we'll see you again next time. God bless.